while he hung upon a splinted cross, drinking for them the wrath of God, suffering, tasting the pangs of the second death for them. While he was there, while salvation's opportunity waited, they stayed below Calvary's saving summit to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin for a season with the warm comfort of their refuge of lies. When the refuge of lies is swept away, they'll get up to Calvary, all right, but there's no cross and there's no Savior. Why? Because God, God Almighty has taken the cross down and taken it away. God closed the door once before on one godless generation and he's going to close it on another. Let us make sure we're on the right side of the line. How desirable then will the refuge of truth and righteousness appear to those who suddenly realize that they have squandered their souls in the refuge of complacency and procrastination and all the other things that come hanging on as a consequence, worldliness, materialism, all of these things. Is that where you want to be hiding? Is that where you're hiding now? You know, I'm going to say the same thing as I always say. When I, in my little bedroom, pray and say, Lord, give me something to speak, I always think of the one person that may be with us, like today. So I'm not ignoring everybody else, but I'm speaking to the one person. For sure, there's one of you. There's got to be one. There's one in every congregation. You're in the wrong refuge, and you know that. You know who you are. You're in the wrong refuge, and you know that. You need to come out. You need to flee now while it's not too late. You see, in the deepening twilight of this closing age, the mercy of God still lingers, but not for long. The door of the ark still stands ajar. There's still a refuge of mercy. But you need to get up. You need to come and get through the door of that saving refuge while there's still time. This cup has already filled its cup of iniquity. This world has already filled its cup of iniquity. Soon it's going to reap the harvest that it's sown. But while the angel of mercy is getting ready to take his flight, never to return, we still have a few more fleeting moments to come to the altar to be washed from our sins, then go up into the ark to find salvation when the storm breaks. We need to go there. God poured out his wrath once upon this world and destroyed it with a flood. He's going to pour his wrath out again on this world and destroy it this time with a fire. And yet, because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, his mercy lingers. His mercy lingers. And this is why, you see, there was another time, 2,000 years ago, when God's wrath, another time, when God's wrath descended downward to this earth, not to destroy it, but strange as it seems, to actually save it. To provide for us a refuge. His wrath came down not to destroy us, but to actually provide for us a refuge. Now that doesn't kind of make sense, but it will when I've finished. On that mysterious and fateful day, the lightning bolts of his righteous anger didn't descend upon Rome, evil place, didn't descend upon the palace of Caesar, didn't descend upon Egypt or the lands of Persia or in any other godless nation on the earth in those days on this wicked planet. The thunderbolts of his wrath were mercilessly deflected from every deserving community, every deserving person, and they targeted and descended onto one single target, and that was a single solitary cross on Calvary's summit. That's where his wrath came down. And because of that, the world that day was given a refuge in the refuge of God's love and his mercy and his long suffering. Because that day, that wrath was sufficient to punish every sin that ever was and to destroy the life of every sinner that ever was. 
But after the pouring of that wrath was still over, the world was still hidden. The sun still shone. The birds still sang. The flowers still bloomed. There was the echo of children's laughter in the streets. What happened? God provided a refuge. So the people then and us now can still see the sunshine, can still hear the birds sing, can still smell the flowers, and in our homes listen to the sound of our little children as they play their innocent little games. Now our little children can play their innocent little games because God provided a shelter, the refuge, a refuge which took the full front of every lightning bolt that we deserve descended upon his own son. And what happened on that mysterious and wondrous day was something that the angels viewed with unspeakable grief and yet wondrous amazement. Because if I can use an allegory, let permit me to paint a word picture and an allegory. The Bible's full of them. Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory, so I guess I've got a right to do that. On that fateful day, when the wrath of God demanded the life of every sinner, God sent his Son out onto that open prairie, all alone to meet that storm. He sent him out all alone, unprotected, to literally walk into the jaws of a raging hell. In silent grief, the angels watched that one lonesome figure wander off into that emptiness of that vast and dark, desolate plain, far darker and desolate than any prayer you'll ever find in Kansas. And they looked in horror and disbelief as that storm of all storms vented its seething wrath and anger upon him. Surely, thought the angels, surely God is going to call him back. He can't let him just walk out there in that storm. God is going to call him back. Surely he's going to call him back. He must. He's going to go get him. But God didn't call him back. And he didn't go and get him. God just stood there, along with the angels, watching Jesus become smaller, like some little soul on a vast ocean lost out there, that little struggling, pitiful, one lonesome figure struggling and falling and stumbling off in the distance as the storm ravished him. Suddenly the blackness belched out thunderbolts, and withering hail just blasted him, just pummeling everything, even himself, down onto the earth, treading him down with its nastiness and its vengefulness. Again and again, as the lightning strikes lit up that plain, the angels could see Jesus. Once in a while, he would look back, and then he'd fall again. A lonesome, struggling figure, just overcome with grief and anguish. For a moment they see him again and he turns around and they see him stumble and they see him fall. And they look with urgency again on the face of God saying, God, we're ready. God's going to call us out. God surely is going to send us out there and bring his son back. Surely now God's going to put an end to this awful, awful suffering. And they looked in the face of God. And God stood there, silent watching with tear-filled eyes his only son stagger onward further, deeper into the jaws of a raging hell. And finally that little figure of Jesus was a tiny speck almost lost from sight. But again as the thunderbolts 
lunge viciously downward to his struggling form, and the, the angels see him writhe and fall down. They can hardly stand it, and so can the father. 